I love that song we just sang, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It holds a special place in my heart because it kind of reminds me of my own childhood growing up and going to church camp. There was a song we sang at camp um, that I'll, I'll sing with you. Hopefully you'll sing with me. We'll see how it goes. Do you know the song Deep and Wide? All right, here we go. I'll do the little actions. Here we go. Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. All right, we'll stop there. We won't go into the rest of it where I start to make you just say, mm and wide, mm and wide, it's funny. I should have brought the, the whole row of kids to come up here and sing that with us, but that's okay. Deep and wide, such an elementary concept sung by children, yet many adults and many Christians fail to absorb the enormity of it. They understand all the blessings that God has given us, which are incalculable, but sometimes fail to understand the proportional effect that it should have in a Christian. Christian gratitude, which is also deep and wide. You know, we think of gratitude, and uh, I wonder what you think of. The basic form of gratitude is simply to say what? Thank you, right? Uh, in a few days, many of you will be huddled around your TV watching one of my favorite Christmas shows, A Christmas Story with little Ralphie and his brother, and there they are opening up packages in front of the Christmas tree, and they get this plush little package, they open it up, and it's got socks. You remember what they do with them? Whoop! They just throw it right over the shoulder. They don't care what it is, and they continue opening the good stuff. I remember as a kid doing the same thing. My grandpa was stand, sitting right in front of me, and I get to the plush package, I open it up, it's socks, I go, whoop! And my mom and dad say, excuse me, you need to say thank you. And so I said, thank you. Thank you is a very important thing. We all need to be able to say thank you. But let's be honest, that kind of gratitude is neither deep nor wide. It's shallow and narrow. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of the guys I really look up to, says this. Listen to this. He says, In ordinary life, we hardly realize that we receive a great deal more than we give, and that it is only with gratitude that life becomes rich. Amen. And here's the kicker. He says, In ordinary life, you and I, don't live ordinary lives. We live anything but ordinary lives. We live extraordinary lives in that we are touched by the hand of God, saved by a Savior, ambassadors, officers for God who is cosmically wonderful. So then the question for us becomes, you know, how is it that we live lives of gratitude, making our life become rich? Well, the first step, according to Dietrich Bonhoeffer's quote, is to understand grace that has been given to us, what you have been given that you could never give back in more amount. Let's think about that for a moment. Let's understand how deep and wide the grace of God is. If I asked you just to list some of the things, some of the wonderful blessings God has given you, I bet you could think of a lot. You might say family, you might say wife, grandkids, friends, house. And some of you more spiritually minded might say the church or forgiveness and yet coming up with a list is not deep and wide enough. So let's talk about grace. Many of y'all will know this definition, but for the kids I want to give this. Grace is defined as an unmerited favor of God. In other words, it's something God has done for you favorably. You did not deserve, you did not earn. He just did it for you. One of my favorite places to go to look at God's grace is Romans chapter 3. I want to read this, verse 22 through 26. Listen to this. 
This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Church, who has sinned and fallen short for the glory of God? All. all. Yeah? Okay. And all are justified freely by His grace through redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Church, who has been freely justified by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus? All of us. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. So did you earn it? You did not. We see grace in Christ dying for you while you were in your sin and extending the possibility of salvation to you that you receive through faith. It's been extended to you. Could you ever give more than you have received? No. So let's understand how deep and wide our gratitude to God should be. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, he says, Give thanks in all circumstances. You've all read that. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And my question for you is, how are you going to give thanks in all circumstances? How? I mean, I, I remember all three of my children's birth. I gave thanks. And I remember having to stay up sometimes. Andy, you stayed up a lot more than I did. But those times I did, whew, that was in the midst of difficulty. I'm not sure I was thankful for those, the lack of sleep in that moment. And yet we are supposed to be thankful in all circumstances. And that's, that's something silly to think about when we think about the more difficult things mankind goes through. From death of a loved one to difficult news. It does not matter. We should be able to give thanks in all circumstances. And we ask ourselves, how in the world would we do that? Well... You have to be a living sacrifice, as Paul says in Romans chapter 12. Change who you are. Be in Christ. And what I would like to do is turn to 2 Corinthians. Turn there with me, chapter 4. That's where I'd like to be just briefly today because we see the effect that God's grace has had on Paul in his ministry. And therefore, in his gratitude that was deep and wide. Chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. We'll read little parts of it. He says, verse 1, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. All right, in short, what he's saying is the Word of God has been given to us. It is one of the gifts he has given to us, and because we are thankful and we love him, we don't change it. It is what it is. We speak truthfully about it. We don't change it so that we might be able to, to get more people to, to somehow come. He says we don't do that. He says, continue on, that verse 3, And even if our gospel is veiled, that means they can't see it, is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. You know, we do not lie. I read an article from Psychology Today by Dr. Let me see, Gad Had. That's his name, Dr. Gad Had. And he, he had polled a thousand people. And of a thousand people, he said that these thousand people, women on average would tell 1.34 lies a day. And men would tell 1.78 
lies a day. So if you round one down, round one up, women, you're twice as good as us guys. You tell one lie a day, and us men tell, on average, two lies a day. Dr. Gadhad says, he spends all this time writing for this psychology today, and he says, you know what? This brings me to one final thought for all those who may be asked the following question. Do these genes make me look fat? He says, go ahead and exercise your daily quota for the day. <laughs> you know, in reality, as an ambassador of God, what should be your average lies a day? Zero. Our ministry never stops. Our tongues should not lie. This is the depth and the width of a gratitude toward a God who has saved you when you did not deserve it. He also talks about his ministry. Look there in verse 5. I love this. He says, For we do not preach ourselves but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Have you noticed we live in a world that's rather egotistical? that thinks about itself. We live in a world, well, I'll tell you as a teacher, that I met many parents who believe they should teach their children that they should strive to be unique, to stand out, to be different. And the only thing it often caused to happen with them was that they would start to have discipline problems. See, I, I tell my children that you are unique in Christ, but that you should strive to be part of something bigger than yourselves. And I'll tell you, there's nothing bigger that you can be part of in this world than God's ministry. To serve other people. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus Christ. Even when he says we do talk about ourselves or we do preach ourselves in that second part, he says... As your servants for Jesus' sake. That is what it means to have a deep and wide gratitude towards God with our service. Another one he says is verse 7. But we, uh, let's back up. He talks about this light that shines in our hearts. And then verse 7. But we have this treasure in, our, in jars of clay. Let me explain. The treasures are the light that has been put in our heart. Right? It is the image of God as he says, in, the, in Jesus Christ. That light's been put in us, and he says that's a jar of clay, meaning your body's a jar of clay. You ever break an arm? You ever get sick? You ever just feel like the world is bearing down on you? Do you feel fragile? Because that's the way life is. You're a human being made of flesh and bone. And he says, look at this, verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. Why? Why do we have these two contrasting things? To show that it is that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And he goes into more detail. Verse 8, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. I don't know if you've noticed, but sometimes your body doesn't, want, doesn't do what you want it to do. I got new glasses this last week, a stronger prescription, and on top of that, I got my ears checked, and the doctor said, you're deaf in this ear. So you know what Lee's been doing all day is he's been following me around on my right side and I've been trying to follow him with my left ear so that I can just claim ignorance about whatever he tells me. Our bodies break down. They don't always do what we want them to do. Our bills may not be what we want them to be. Gas prices are certainly not what we want them to be. But then the question is for you, how does that affect you? Does it? Should it? We have something more powerful within our hearts, something eternal, the glory of God. 
Life is bigger than any one of these moments. We get to live eternity in the presence of the Father. And this one moment on earth, this little time we live is just like a sand on the shores of eternity, a little grain of sand. That is how deep and wide our gratitude is for God in that He begins to change us from the inside out and we look at things differently. And finally, verse 10, we always carry around in our bodies the death of Jesus. Well, that sounds kind of morbid. You carry around the death of Jesus in you? Yes, we say. Because within each and every one of us, we carry the understanding that Christ has died for us, but we also carry within us his sacrifice of what that meant and his steps to Golgotha and the fact that in Gethsemane, even knowing everything that would happen when they called for him, he stepped forward. When you carry within you the death of Jesus, you can't not carry the life as well. The life of Jesus living in, within you. The final deep and wide form of gratitude as a Christian is to follow Christ's example. When he took on the burdens of others, the question is, now you, whether you are 70 or 14, do you carry the burdens of others and help others? If we live with the death of Christ, we must live with the life of Christ also. So then the question is, what does all this gratitude on the count of God's grace do? Look now at verse 15. All this, he says, is for your benefit. All what? The death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the ministry, everything. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people has grace reached you. Has God's grace reached you? Because if God's grace has reached you, then it should affect you somehow so that you would be in some form of ministry for God, meaning someone else should be affected by God's grace which has reached you. Does that make sense? It's like a domino effect. You push one domino over, they, the others can't help but fall over. God's grace has affected you, and therefore, look at me, you should affect others. With God's grace. Look what it does. In light of Thanksgiving coming on Thursday, look what it does, church. Grace that is reaching more and more people may cause Thanksgiving to overflow. I'm not talking about Thursday. I'm talking about overflowing. I'm not talking about lip service. I'm talking about a change of life. And your priorities, what you think is important, the way you spend your time. Thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. God's grace should affect you, calling you as an ambassador, and it should change your life and cause you to work for Him, whatever job you have. Whether you're in college or high school or junior high or retired, life should be different it causes others to receive God's grace, which then glorifies God. And there's no greater way to show thankfulness to the Creator who created you than to change and follow Him. Now, I don't know if you've been watching the news over the last week, week, two weeks, three weeks. You got uh, Kyle Rittenhouse's mother who said right before, by the way, he was uh, counted as uh, innocent of all charges. But before the whole court case, Kyle Rittenhouse's mother says he was at the mercy of the court. I bring this up because I want you to imagine for a moment you're in court. Not Kyle Rittenhouse, but you. And you're not being charged with murder. Something more important. More life-changing. Are you or are you not a Christian? In other words... Let's say in 50 years from now, you're in court and they're trying to find you guilty of being a Christian under a court of law. Will they? Will they look at the evidence of your life, 
the way you spend your time in private, what you do at school or work or with your wife or at your job, your schedule? Will they look at all those things and say, not a shadow of a doubt this person is a Christian, throw them in prison, take away the key? See, this is my hope. If that ever comes to that point, my hope is that uh, they send the jury out of the room for me. And they say, there's no point. And before the gavel hits the, that little wooden pad, the judge looks at me and says, to my joy, you have been tried for being a Christian. It is obvious. And I'll say, praise God. You see, I bring this up because a lot of people say they are a Christian and they don't actually live with the kind of gratitude that grace would produce in a person. Do you remember the parable of the virgins? There's a parable where these, these virgins are waiting for the bridegroom to come pick them up. And some of them, out of all this ingratitude, they don't have gratitude for the moment. They have this whole day to prepare and they do not prepare their lamps. They don't trim them. And these other ones do. And when the bridegroom hasn't come, it's getting dark. They say, can we have some oil? They say, no, we appreciate this moment too much. You need to go get your own. So they run off to go get their own. They're gone and they miss the bridegroom coming for them. They come back to the house and you know what they see? No one's there. He's gone. And so they run through the streets till they find his house. Lord, Lord, open the door for us. He says, truly, truly, I never knew you. Do not allow a life of ingratitude to take you over. Instead, live, as Paul wrote to the Corinthians, live with the death and life of Jesus in you. And remember that saying thank you is not deep and wide enough. This Thursday, when you're saying thank you to God for all the blessings, that one day is not deep and wide enough. You got to say thank you with your life. You know, as I think of the story of any kind of marriage, like with the, the virgins, I cannot help but think about the feast. And by that I mean when the bridegroom comes and we get to hall, have this feast, this final feast looking together, seeing our family members that have gone on before us, celebrating the fact that there's no, more, there's no more death, there's no more illness, celebrating the fact that there's no more persecution. Here we are celebrating what Christ has done for us, the feast. I don't know what you're eating Thursday, but this feast is going to put that to shame. And I'm going to be honest with you. The two things we're about to take put that to shame. Here in a moment, we're going to take communion. We're going to take the bread and we're going to take the juice. And we do this to remember Christ. But don't just simply let that be a remembrance you do once a week. If you want to have gratitude for a God who saved you when you didn't deserve it, we should remember him every day 